All right, I think we'll get started. I know there was a bit of a late start to the break, but folks are still filtering in. So good morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming uh, to this session. My name is Jeremy Grant. I'm Managing Director of Technology Business Strategy at Venable, uh, a law firm based in DC uh, that has a significant data security and privacy practice. Uh, some might have seen that I was uh, announced on this schedule a couple months ago, back when I was working at a different company talking about liability and thought, why do I want to hear somebody who's not at a law firm talk about liability? Well, I'm not a lawyer. I at least managed to join uh, Venable last week uh, to uh, somehow give me a, a better position to talk about all of this. But I want to talk today about uh, something that's really fascinating going on in the state of Virginia, uh, which is an effort to try and address risk in federated identity systems uh, by promoting and driving adoption of strong identity standards. So to lay out what's happening in Virginia, um, you know, Federation, for those, th th this isn't exactly a, a, a crew who doesn't understand it, uh, Federation has always had what I would define as a liability conundrum, particularly in the consumer identity space, where for years we've been trying to somehow incent uh, more people to start leveraging uh, third-party credentials uh, for uh, different applications. But time after time, we've had you know, challenges where attorneys simply couldn't wrap their head around all of the risk that would exist between the identity provider, the relying party, and the individual user. Who would actually be liable in circumstances where something goes wrong, where the systems don't work the way that they were intended to? One of the problems that we've had over the years is that this risk between the three actors has been very hard to define. So while I'm not an attorney, I found you know, those that I've worked with, folks like Tom over the years, have you know, pointed out, I think Tom's got a pretty good handle on it, but a lot of his colleagues in the legal profession have had a hard time getting their head around it. So this unbounded, unallocated risk has discouraged trust and inhibited the take up of strong federated identity solutions. So the state of Virginia has jumped in with an approach to try and improve this risk equation. So the history of all of this uh, started in 2015 when Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe signed Senate Bill 814 into law. It was called the Virginia Electronic Identity Management Act. And it did a few things that were pretty interesting that no state's ever done before. One, uh, it defined some number, a number of key identity terms into law, terms that, that we talk about all the time, like trust framework operator or, or uh, identity provider, uh, actually codified them into law, and provided a common legal framework for identity system participants. Second, it provided some limitations of liability for identity providers and identity trust framework operators if they do some certain things that we're going to get to. Uh, and in order to help figure out what those things are, they created a body called the Identity Management Standards Advisory Council, or IMSAC, uh, in Virginia. So what's the big idea here? Well, I talked before about the issues with risk today. So you know, notionally, you know, we've got high risk between all three parties without any certainty as to how the risk could be mitigated or allocated in federation system, the market has stalled. So you know, what I've you know, drawn here, might be a little hard to see with the, uh, the small print, is basically saying risk equals 10x. You know, so call it, uh, if each unit of uh, risk is the value x, and we're just considering this from a hypothetical standpoint. Uh, you know, 10x is sort of what we're looking at today. So in theory, if you can actually get identity providers to embrace high standards and best practices, Risk could be driven out of the equation. You would shrink each of the risk uh, between the IDP and the RP and the IDP to the user, say down to one unit of X. So you're basically reducing it 90%. And again, this is just a hypothetical because we really don't know how this would all work in practice, but you would basically have the risk between uh, using federated identity uh, between individual users and relying parties. So the idea is if we could shrink this ball of risk that nobody can get their arms around, define it better, and then drive some of it out of the equation, we can incent more adoption and use of strong federated identity systems. Now, to incent identity providers to raise the bar and drive out risk, this new law would grant liability protections to firms that are certified in accordance with Virginia standards. Now, the big but with all of this, and there is a very big but, if the standards and best practices aren't strong, all this does is end up transferring risk away from identity providers today to relying parties and individuals. Um, this would make things worse. It would further disincent market participants from actually embracing federation systems. And I'll point out when this law was first passed, I was actually quite skeptical because my personal observation over the years is that the world has not been lacking uh, companies that are interested in being identity providers. In fact, it seems like there's a new one popping up every week. What they've lacked, and I probably should have worn my ain't no party like a relying party t-shirt from the 2012 CIS, uh, event is relying parties who are actually interested in accepting these systems and leveraging them instead of their own. 
they've lacked consumers who are actually looking to trust their identity with a third party uh, for high value transactions. So giving liability protection to identity providers would be a massive disaster if all it did was transfer more risk to the two parties who are already the least incented to participate today. Um, but we can actually drive risk out of the equation by having them embrace the best practices. This can really do some good. So the purpose of the Identity Management Standards Advisory Council, and this is my words, not theirs, is to make sure that Virginia's new identity standards are beyond reproach, they're absolutely best in class, and if followed properly, can actually be used to drive risk out of the identity market. So here's the members. I'm one of them. Uh, it's chaired by Lisa Kimball, uh, who's with Telos, a company uh, in Virginia that does a lot of identity solutions, primarily for government. Nelson Moe, who's the CIO for Virginia. Uh, Dave Burhop, who's the CIO and Deputy Commissioner of the Virginia DMV, uh, although Dave just left about three weeks ago. He's taken a new job with the Virginia General Assembly, so we've lost him from the commission, and I think lost him from a lot of other identity things he was doing, which is a, not a good thing, given how great Dave was. Uh, Katie Krebs, who's VP for Card Tech of Capital One, uh, I'm on there. Uh, Tom Moran, who's executive director of a nonprofit called the All Hazards Consortium uh, that does a lot of work in, uh, working with first responders, uh, and we're, you know, they have some significant needs for uh, identity. Uh, Jeff Subricki, who works uh, with Walmart's Office of Government Relations, and Mike Watson, who's the agency CISO. So I want to dive a little bit into what the law actually covers, because it's interesting, as I was saying before, that it codifies uh, in legislation at the state level for the first time uh, some common, uh, commonly used identity terms that generally haven't been recognized in, in law. So uh, the first is an identity proofer. Uh, I think most folks you know, know what that is, but you know, somebody who's a person or entity authorized to act as a representative of an identity provider in the confirmation of a potential identity credential holder's identification and identity attributes prior to issuing a credential to a person. It also defines identity providers um, as an entity, supplier, employer, agent thereof, certified by an identity trust framework operator. That's an important distinction to provide credentials that may be used by an identity credential holder to assert his identity or any related attributes in a digital or online transaction. And it states for purposes of this chapter, an IDP includes an attribute provider, an identity proofer, and any suppliers, employees, or agents thereof. Uh, it also, around the limitation of liability, designates that both trust framework operators and identity providers are entities that are eligible to seek liability protection from the state. And it puts some parameters on liability protection to the instrument, what they say, the issuance of specific instruments by the trust framework operator or the IDP around credentials, attributes, and trust marks. The limitation of liability is also interesting that they lay out uh, in terms of it puts some conditions that are in place to get this liability protection. So one, you have to comply with Virginia's minimum standards and specifications. This is the work that the advisory council is now contemplating what should those be. Uh, it also ties to terms of contractual agreements and points to rules and policies governing the trust framework. And it defines some constraints around which liability protection will and will not apply. So it will apply, or attach is the legal term, uh, for anybody, any situation where there's misuse of a credential by either the credential holder or other parties. It won't attach if somebody does it, uh, if one of the IDPs or trust framework operators uh, can be proven to have uh, been grossly negligent or engaged in willful misconduct. Now, Tom's pointed out before, this is really interesting. Uh, by the way, who the folks who don't know Tom Smedinghoff, Tom is an attorney here in Chicago with Lock Lord. He chairs uh, the ABA's Identity Management uh, Committee and uh, has just done gobs of great work over the years. Tom pointed out. So gross negligence uh, isn't covered, but what if you're just negligent? Plain old negligence is different than gross negligence. So these are some of the questions that have come up with, with Virginia's law. So one of the questions that has come up with all of this, you know, as I said before, is the advisory council is actually considering uh, what standards uh, ought to be used and what you know, things should look like is, well, what's the certification program going to be? Uh, because certification is going to be a really big issue. If we just put standards that are out there, uh, somebody isn't actually going to be able to claim some sort of a legal protection unless they can specifically point to, you know, what are they, uh, what are they following? Does anybody actually bother to pay attention or, you know, look at closely uh, what standards they're using? So the legislation makes clear that qualification for liability protection under the Act uh, requires the trust framework operators and identity providers demonstrate compliance with the Commonwealth's minimum specification and standards. It states the termination of compliance 
is going to remain subjective and open to dispute without an authorized certification and maintenance process. And the, you know, the states actually pointed out if we don't have any authorized certification and maintenance process, it then basically puts the burden on the court in case there's a dispute to make a determination in terms of whether a trust framework operator or an identity provider was doing the right thing uh, anytime there's an issue. So the state is currently teed up uh, to the commission, uh, three options to look at for certification. One would be that the Commonwealth of Virginia itself actually established a central certification authority and operate it themselves. So the only entity that would actually be able to certify uh, identity providers or trust frameworks would be the state of Virginia. The second would be to look at an independent third party certification authority acting on behalf of the Commonwealth. It could be a private uh, entity, it could be a non-governmental entity, or it could even potentially be another government. Um, you know, so this could be looking to something, say, like Kantara and their certification scheme uh, as the foundation of what uh, Virginia does. And then the third option that's been teed up on the table, although I'm, I'm personally skeptical that it will work, is self-certification executed independently by trust framework operators uh, and identity providers. So what has this committee done to date? Well, one of the things I, one of the reasons I was really excited to have this talk accepted at CIS is that the committee's been doing interesting work, but from my perspective, it has not been getting nearly enough attention. Uh, and part of it is, I think, the way that advisory councils work, it's a very formal process, you know, established in law to set up an advisory council in Virginia, is it's not particularly conducive to, uh, in my opinion, getting broad input. Uh, we meet once a quarter uh, down at the Virginia IT Administration, which is an office basically in the middle of nowhere uh, in Chester, Virginia, way outside uh, the Richmond Beltway. So it's, you know, a two hour, two to three hour drive from Washington, D.C., um, and not particularly close to any place else. Uh, the meetings aren't uh, webcast or you can't call into them, you have to be in person. Um, and, you know, while documents are posted online in advance of the meeting and minutes are posted, um, you know, in 2017, this is not the sort of thing if we're really looking for widespread input from folks, uh, the, the, the state's just not set up when they run their advisory councils to do all of this. Um, what they do do, however, though, is put their proceedings online. Uh, and the link's here, and you know, I can, you know, anybody wants to follow up with me afterwards, I'm happy to share it to you if you don't want to write down 6442474. Anyways, you get it. Um, but I think we're at a point right now where the work that the uh, advisory council is doing is getting to a point where if it, this is going to work, if it's going to have the impact that we want, it needs to start getting input uh, and, you know, frankly, some constructive criticism from a wider variety of people across the identity ecosystem. So we've been having quarterly meetings, uh, for the most part, a couple have been canceled uh, due to travel schedules, lack of forum, things like that. Where we've gotten testimony and input from a number of identity and legal experts. Uh, we've gotten as far uh, as recommending documents based on the new uh, NIST special publication 863-3, uh, which, knock on wood, I'm hoping is formalized uh, any day now. Stay tuned for maybe a hot announcement later this week on that. Uh, as the basis for the standards, the idea being that um, if they're going to point to something, this is probably the best thing to point to. Uh, we've started to explore options for certification, but haven't really dug into that yet. I think that's going to be the, the work of uh, the committee in the fall and, and going forward. And we've considered some requirements that have been teed up for privacy, security, and confidentiality, as well as identity management of non-person entities, uh, although in the latter, that's mostly referencing some other work that's been done by other trade organizations. I think it's going to be hard to actually build something in scope that we can define enough to, um, well, to grant liability protection. So all the proceedings are online uh, at uh, vita.virginia.gov, um, and you know, I'd encourage folks, if they are interested in this topic, take a look at what's been posted so far, take a look at the work of the committee. If you're really interested, come on down to Chester for, uh, for one of the meetings and actually speak up and, and explain what you think the, the organization needs to be doing next. Um, I don't know what to do around Chester, but it's not far from Richmond, which isn't a bad town. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take uh, any questions.
So I've not seen any other state try to do something like this. Although, you know, one of my observations, as somebody who's been in and around government over the years, is states, when something is successful, like to copy each other. Um, Virginia, you know, part of the motivation for this, um, a lot of the work for this was driven uh, by a couple of companies that are in Virginia uh, who were in the identity business who thought this would be helpful for the industry, uh, but also uh, with an eye toward making Virginia, say, the, the Delaware for incorporation for identity companies, assuming this is going to be a looming industry going forward. The thought was that Virginia can set, uh, uh, you know, set the standard for, uh, for liability protection and, and set standards around that, that it would somehow advantage Virginia uh, you know, as a place to incorporate and do business going forward. So I haven't seen anything similar pop up in other states, uh, but I have had at least a couple conversations with other states saying, that's interesting, we're going to watch this. Um, I think, the, so this is an interesting question actually. So uh, when I was in government, so for those who don't know me, I ran NSIC, the National Strategy for Trusted Identities in Cyberspace for a little over four years. One of the things that NSIC specifically flagged was um, that there might be a need for something like this. We might need liability protection at some point in order to really get this whole concept of the identity ecosystem to take off. Um, and I will say there was, and some of you in the room probably remember this, there was a window uh, within the identity uh, ecosystem steering group uh, where folks in the White House actually said, hey, we might introduce cyber legislation soon. What do you think we should do here? Do we need something in liability? And the overwhelming answer uh, was, we're not sure. Um, and in fact, I think Tom raised the point at the time, it may be too soon to act, and if we rush something through, it could actually set us back, uh, much as, frankly, the Virginia effort, if we don't get this right, could as well. Uh, so in that regard, um, I agree this might be something that's needed to be done in the federal level eventually. The flip side is I like that the state is taking this on. States are traditionally great uh, policy laboratories uh, for, uh, for the country. And it's nice that you know, one state is at least trying to do something here that then might provide a model for what to do. In fact, when um, I was still at NIST when this legislation passed and we got a whole bunch of questions about it and my take was, you know, we were funding pilots at the time, mostly focusing on technologies, identity solutions, bringing together uh, new types of, uh, you know, consortia that could actually demonstrate the use of trusted identity technologies that align with NSTIC. My take was, hey, Virginia's gonna run a free policy pilot for us. And, you know, we're gonna, you know, in a few years, see what happens and learn some things from it, and hopefully that can inform, you know, next steps. So I do think eventually you might need this at the federal level. Um, the flip side is we might just figure this all out in contract language and this might actually be a step that's way too complicated uh, and doesn't actually help the market. So I, I'll say when I was asked to join the commission, I did so um, with, I'd say, a healthy mix of curiosity uh, and skepticism. Great question. What do you think, Tom? Yeah. Yeah, so I think if you're an IDP and you say Virginia law governs, then you have those protections. Right. Yeah, so if I am Bank of America and I, you know, sign a contract with a Virginia-based IDP and that contract states that Virginia is the law of jurisdiction, that's, that's how you get the advantage there. Tom.
It's a good question. So I've been raising this issue in some of the committee meetings. I'd say that, you know, w with the frequency that we're meeting, we haven't dug into this yet. And there's also some question about whether that's in our scope, whether or whether that's more for um, other aspects of what the state has to do to implement the law, or whether the courts would still have the ability to do so. Um, so again, this is the question of how much authority goes to the certifier to come in and do those, you know, audits or that look back relative to uh, the court itself. Um, I mean, I did mention before, one thing, you know, the state has flagged is if we don't have certification, it pushes all of this to the court. So I think the idea is we want to keep them out of it. Um, but would that stop a judge who was curious, particularly if there was some compelling evidence that, you know, this didn't work? I don't know. Um, I mean, one of my concerns with all of this, you know, like I said before, is if we don't get this right, it can make things worse. Um, and my, my personal view is as good as the work has been, that's been done these days through different trust frameworks in terms of getting companies to raise the bar, has it gotten to a point that it's good enough that we would actually want to start granting liability protections? I, I don't know the answer to that, but I think it's, it's an open discussion of, um, you know, is it, are we really at that point yet? John. Yeah, so electronic, uh, John's question was around, uh, Virginia more recently passed an Electronic Credentials Act, which is basically creating options to do a digital driver's license uh, in Virginia uh, that be, I guess, you know, derived from but separate from the physical card. Um, our committee's had no role in that. That was separate legislation. So I've been following it just on the outside, you know, with curiosity. Uh, you know, there's, you know, Virginia is one of a number of states that's been looking at this issue. Um, you know, separately, we've seen some things. In fact, that the Morpho Trust, you know, where Mark's with in the back of the room, uh, has done, you know, starting with NSTIC pilots in North Carolina and Georgia, and now they have a paying customer in Alabama, and I think you guys are going to have some more soon. Yep, so not ready to announce yet, but so there's a lot happening there, uh, but no, our, th th this commission is not, not tied to, to that. Yes? Um, well, I guess it depends on who you ask. There have been, you know, I mean, part of the issue in Virginia is, th th so they're an interesting state in that the governor can't run for re-election, so everybody gets a single term, and then things turn over. So you have, the states always have a lot of turnover anyways when it comes to, um, you know, particularly folks like in the CIO world, but it, it's particularly acute in Virginia. Um, so there have been times uh, when they were very, very focused on potentially using these credentials. Uh, or looking to actually leverage the DMV uh, for digital credentials. And then there's times when, hey, a different cabinet secretary comes into an agency that was going to use it and decides it's, it's a bad idea. So right now, um, this is outside, that, that's how it's used by the state is outside the scope. But one would think if you want to actually make this whole scheme work, uh, you know, it'd be pretty important for the state to actually eat its own dog food here and use these credentials. But that's just my view. work to do, you know, so speaking of turnover in the state, it's interesting, Virginia's got an election coming up this fall. So Governor McAuliffe, who signed this, uh, won't be in office uh, come next January. Um, I think there are, they would like to have something before then, is my, this is just me speaking, because governors like to point to something and say, hey, we finished what we started. Um, I, I think this is going to go on, you know, the, the, my appointment to the commission is for four years. We're about 18 months into it right now. Uh, I think it's going to take another 18 months at least before they can really get something in place. Um, so that, that's just my take. Any other questions? Hey, Andrew. Yes. 
I, I think that's something that would be very helpful. I mean, one question that's come up is, should Virginia just point to the federal government to FICAM? Except that raises other questions. One, what is FICAM these days? Because there's a lot of that's being redefined and rethought. And two, you know, like I mentioned earlier, is that good enough? You know, is it good enough for to be granting liability protection? Is that possibly a higher bar than you know where we've been today? So. Um, I think as the commission gets into the certification scheme, I actually already flagged it and we need to invite Kantara to come speak. All right, anybody else? I think we're at time. Well, thank you for your time today. Much appreciated.